When it comes to agricultural input, we have the numbers. We know the number of tractors, the number of seeds, the number of fishing boats. The same with agricultural output. We know the number of tons, the number of goats, the size of the catch. We know the value of natural resources. And from population statistics, we can estimate that the food needs of the developing world will double in the next three decades, and that the production on existing land will also have to double in order to provide enough food. So we can use these numbers to give us a picture of the state of the world's food security, even to predict the future. We can also use these numbers when writing government policy or designing development projects meant to increase agricultural productivity. But underneath all of this, something is missing. It's a phantom statistic. A statistic that could be used to produce tangible and sustainable improvements in the quality of rural life at the household and community levels. A statistic that could have an impact at the national level. This phantom is the statistic that tells us about the specific role of women in agriculture. Let's face it, we all know that women play an enormous role in agricultural production, processing and marketing. Just observing the activities in fields, farms and fishing villages, we see that women are there. We can see that they have specific tasks and responsibilities and that their contributions are extremely valuable. Yet their presence in agricultural statistics is almost invisible invisible for several reasons. For one thing, there is just not enough information on the specific contributions of women. Gathering and analysing data on rural women is seen as only marginally relevant because much of the work of women is in the informal sector, which means that it is often unpaid, or it is seasonal work and thus is not counted, even though it represents a huge segment of national output. So, in spite of the fact that women make this enormous contribution to the agricultural sector, and in spite of the fact that we know their roles and responsibilities differ greatly from the roles of men, when data is collected, it is rarely analysed to extrapolate gender-specific information. And even if this information is extracted and analysed, there has been little follow-through in actually incorporating gender issues into policy or project planning. Governments and development agencies do recognise that the gap needs to be narrowed between merely recognising the need to empower women and actually factoring women's needs, capabilities and constraints into project planning. In Kenya, harvests from women's plots would increase by 20% if women had the same inputs as men. In Burkina Faso, production could be increased by 10 to 20% if women had the same resources as men. These are the kinds of results that we all want from development projects, but in order to get them, the correct type of information must be available so the resources can be allocated correctly. Just look at what asking the right questions can mean. On the household level, just by observing how the activities of men and women differ during the course of one day, you get a picture of the importance of women in household food security. In this sequence, we divide the screen, husband on the left, wife on the right, clock in the middle, to show you the difference in the activities of a typical day. What you see is that her day is very fragmented, and often her duties overlap while his day is broken down into larger segments, leaving more time for planning and reflection and leisure. Here in the Dominican Republic, a conventional agricultural survey found women's labour rates to be 21%. But using a different type of survey that included gardening and animal care in the definition of work, the women's labour rate became 84%. In India, the national census found that only 27% of rural women were economically active. Yet, using a different type of survey that counts activities such as collecting firewood, 
maintaining kitchen gardens and raising animals brought the number to more than 60%. We spoke of the informal sector. Well, we also know that 80% of women in low-income countries rely on the informal sector for their livelihoods, which is rarely recognised in national-level statistics. And we know that poverty rate of the female population is increasing much more rapidly than the poverty rate of the male population. In fact, the difference is startling. In the last 25 years, the number of men who live in poverty has increased by 30%, but the number of women who live in poverty has increased by 50%. These are the facts that make us realise how crucial sex disaggregated statistics are for decision makers and government policy planners who wish to increase agricultural production and alleviate poverty. There are so many ways this information can be helpful. It can mean better targeting of extension activities, knowing in advance who performs which tasks, so extensionists know who should receive training and what season or time of day they would be available. Or, on a national level, it means governments will have more background information when they determine such things as how to allocate resources or to whom to provide credit. We also know that in addition to these agricultural censuses and production surveys and natural resource outlooks, we need to understand the human resources. Who are these women and men who are planting the seeds, raising the animals, catching the fish? Who are these women and men who borrow money so they can buy better equipment, sell their crops, pay back their loans? If the questions aren't asked, there is no way to extrapolate answers, answers that will support development projects on the local or national level. As we saw in the examples from the Dominican Republic and India, the type of methodology used for gathering the information is extremely important. All of these numbers only have value if the proper use is made of them. That's one of the reasons FAO organised this high-level consultation on rural women and information. We need to work together with member nations to determine the best ways to analyse information that is sex disaggregated. We need to get the message out that this kind of information will provide policymakers the tools to design development programs and formulate policy that provides support to the needs of both women and men. The role of FAO in all of this is to compile the raw data that is gathered by its member nations. If FAO doesn't have the right type of information coming in, it will not be possible to provide the kind of gender-sensitive analysis that will be helpful to policymakers and the media. Thinking again about the doubling food needs of the developing world and the need to increase production on existing land, it becomes obvious that if these demands are to be met, it is imperative that all possible contributors, both the women and the men, be counted that they be considered for what they have to offer, that their needs be addressed, and that every advantage be taken of their potential.